Oh, hello. Can you hear me? Hello, yes. Oh, good. Good, good, good. Okay, cool. So, thank you everybody for coming, joining us virtually, digitally. Um, we've just been listening to uh, a recording from an album which is called uh, Remixing the Global Lockdown. And uh, I thought it would be a relevant thing to share now with some sound recording. This particular last one was from a recording from Paris um, called Emerging from the Lockdown, which is exactly what we're sort of doing at the moment. So um, obviously soundscapes are changing and something we've been very aware of. Um, so uh, my name's Kimball. Um, I I'm going to give a little brief introduction and uh, then I'm going to pass over to uh, Sol Perez Martinez, uh, who um, I've been co curating this um, open call with drawing maps, imagined landscapes, and pandemic storytelling. And um, the call that was actually uh, called, um, oh my God, what was the call called? Um, <laughs> In the post COVID world. Thank you. Good. Ah, oh, your voice is there as well. Good. I felt, I felt really alone suddenly. Um, uh, yes, a post-COVID world um, and really what we've been uh, inviting people to do is to respond to uh, the pandemic uh, and through drawing and um, other means to, to produce something which somehow resembles a map but is really thinking about a map as a form of uh, telling a story about something uh, personal and um, thinking about personal ways of uh, representing spaces, particularly the spaces that we're, we're in. Um, so what I wanted to do, first of all, was just to give a, a little introduction into thinking about drawing and mark making as a tool for imagining and reimagining spaces. Um, so Living Maps is essentially a, an organization that, that thinks about maps and what a map can be. And maps are not necessarily a place to, or a, a way of sort of finding your way around, but can also be uh, a something which is, it could be anything really, some, something that has a representation of something that relates to a place and and i'm particularly interested in this idea of um particularly thinking about drawing and mark making as a way of connecting to and um imagining places uh so a map is not necessarily something that tells you where to go it may be highly inaccurate but it's really more about the process of making uh the that physical uh thing um and so i have a project which this sort of fits when, within my general project, which is called Unmapping, which is thinking about the role of the imagination um, and fantasy in, in the context of places, and particularly thinking about how mark making uh, can capture both um, the way you feel about a place and certain uh, emotional um, attachments that you might have. So, um, Mark making can be a way of connecting to memories um, and it can be a way of connecting to your your own feelings about a a particular place uh, it could be something that you do uh, by yourself uh, it can also be something that you do within a group it could be a way of sharing things um, sharing things that you have within yourself uh, and it could also be a way of sharing things within within a group um, and the interesting thing about drawing is, or about, I should say, mark making rather than drawing, uh, is it's about this physical connection, uh, physical and material connection between uh, your, your headspace and the paper. And I'm particularly interested in this idea of not the, the, represent the, the representation of how we imagine and remember spaces, uh, drawing is a bit like entering into a dream or entering into this 
yeah it's this this physical sensory connection between the place that you you see in your head and the place that exists on the paper um so a map in some extent is is a bit like a i see it as similar to this, this idea of a palimpsest or a pentimento um thinking about a map as a representation of different layers of different realities uh, existing over time um and so there there is this there's different elements of um both places that, that overlap and also temporal spaces um so maybe it's remembering a place that exists that you're that you're not physically able to get to right now because it's far away or perhaps it's a play it's it's a place which exists in your your memory and so there's this temporal detachment um but drawing is also a way that you can think about a way that uh, think about places that, that could potentially exist in the future and that's really where this uh this idea of utopia comes in which we'll get onto in just a moment um so there's these yeah these these different layers thinking about imagining a, a place like here something that something's happening in the here and now something that happens in the past and something that might happen in the future and recently i found a a book on the streets it was outside somebody's uh, house actually uh somebody had left it on their doorstep and it's the the title of the book is the fields beneath um and it's by Gillian Tyndall um it's written in the 70s and in the the beginning it there's a description of it which describes uh London it's talking about north london um and describing this really wonderful bucolic image of the fields sleeping beneath the surface of the city so even though there's this sort of built landscape underneath it there is still the 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 actual the field the the, the physical land um and I, I just I really like that idea in the context of mapping, thinking of a map also as this sort of multi-layered um, thing and the, the marks that are on that page telling the story of the, the different layers. Um, and so before I pass over to Sol, just a moment, um, I just wanted to briefly uh, introduce my own drawing for this this project, which was um, uh, a, a, it's more of a collage actually, um, and it was made thinking not so much about a, a utopian future, but more thinking about a place that I'm not able to reach right now. And I chose the the room that I used to live in in Tokyo a few years ago when I was there, um, and um, I started by thinking about the the room itself, physically imagining the walls, and that was the the, the drawing of the room, um, and then really imagining the the streets surrounding it, and um, using the process of drawing to enter into this um, this this space of of memory. Um, so that was this is just a very sort of like brief introduction to to you know the role of drawing. Uh, in in as a, as a mapping tool, um, and seeing how uh, it's about the process of um, it's more about the process than than the product itself. Um, yeah. So now I'll pass over to Sol. Hi, hi everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I'm Sol, I'm a Chilean architect and researcher and also part of the Living Maps advisory team. And uh, I want to tell you a little bit of how we came up with this open call. With Kimball, we came up with this idea of an open call during one of our Living Maps meetings chaired by Phil Cohen, who is the director of Living Maps, who is somewhere here in the call as well. Uh, we were appalled by the social injustices highlighted by the pandemic and the sense of restraint imposed by the lockdown. So we wanted to invite people to use images to create alternative worlds, ideal worlds, worlds where we can put our minds to rest in a way. With Kimball, we discussed how mapping and drawing can help us imagine a space to heal or escape while confined. 
Inspired as well by the expressions of generosity and mutual aid among neighbors, we wanted to invite people to use their imagination to create the world they would like to encounter when the lockdown is over. It was a playful invitation, but also an invitation to reflect on social change. This pandemic has forced on us a very different way of living, which we're all aware of. But we wanted to point out that alongside these difficulties also comes the possibilities for radical change. I found inspiration for this call in the work of Colin Ward, who you're seeing the front cover of his book, Utopia, published in 1974. This is, uh, Colin Ward for me is the center of my PhD, so I'm very attached to the work and the writings of this, of this man. Ward starts by asking, I'll ask you the next slide, Kimbo, please. Uh, Ward starts by asking, what is your ideal place? What, what would it like to be there? He invites us to write a description and draw, map, or model before you go any further in the book. And this is the first, uh, this is the first page, and it's really nice because there's a photo of Colin Ward with his son, Ben Ward, as well. And it's a playful book. This is a book for secondary students to introduce them to the idea of utopia as a working idea. Ward wants young people to reflect on how their places, their ideal places, their own utopias, are different to other people's utopias understanding that each of these creator worlds would depend on the person's perspective or situation. He says, if you look carefully, you'll find utopias always tell you something, often a great deal, about the people who thought of them. So do real places. So this is his way as well of connecting, um, thinking about utopias to environmental education, using the built environment as a way of understanding the world and trying to think about the ideas behind how the world is created in the same way he thinks about utopias. He goes on in this book to show different utopian examples from Thomas More's to Archie Graham's walking city that we see in these pages here, from the island to the country cottage. But the real question behind this imagined, imagined world is how could we or should we live? So that is really the idea behind this book. By inviting people to think about their own ideal place, what is talking about prefiguration, which is a concept that I'm really interested in. The idea of building a new world in the shell of the old, the creation of alternative relationships. Frank Sankina argue that prefiguration fosters the idea that radical change does not come from a single revolutionary moment, but it is a continuous process. And that is really the idea behind words pushing the utopia also as a pedagogical tool. Ursula Le Guin, uh, an author that I really like, uh, called this process as well imaginative fiction. She says, imaginative fiction trains people to be aware that there are other ways to do things, that there are other ways to be. It trains the imagination. Close quote. Uh, so in this book that we see another uh, lovely uh, spread of the book here in the, in, the, in the slides, there's a mix of architecture, planning, history, and anarchist references. Uh, there are all the favorite topics of Colin Ward. It argues that our ideal place can be around the corner, not in a distinct remote future. And this is what I really like about his way of thinking about utopia. So I will, uh, the next slide, I think that, yes. So my ideal world is a community garden, an allotment near my home, following the prefiguration idea of Colin Ward. I don't, I don't want to look further away. It's just outside of my window, but in lockdown, I can't access that. So in that line of thought, my response to our call was to create an, an, an allotment. Uh, if I can ask the next, yeah, great. So an allotment in an almost abandoned bowling green in Hackney Downs Park, my local park, and add a few bits and bobs to improve the design of a park that has been completely underused until this pandemic where it has never been as alive as before. So absolutely full of people. But it's also a park that has been a little bit unlocked. So it made me think about like, what can we have there? Um, so during lockdown, I thought constantly about food security and growing things as a mental health strategy as well. Given the lack of space where I live, I started looking for an adequate sport in my neighborhood. My collage, in a way, is an invitation for the neighbors to imagine the possibilities of Hackney Downs and maybe campaigned for a better use of certain abandoned areas of this park. It uses a collage as a prefiguration of a world where we can share land, grow our food and develop stronger community bonds with our neighbors, all near our home. So this is my little version of my utopia. So I want to share with you 
well, this, this is a little map of Hagney Downs and it has a big pond. It has uh, an area to grow vegetables. And, and I'm interestingly using um, traveling magazines, those places where we can't uh, really access to create this imagine of a world that can be accessible right now, but it's not yet available. So that was my little thing. Okay, thanks, Sol. Um, so I forgot to mention in the beginning um, the the kind of the housekeeping uh, stuff, um, and uh, you're all on you're all on mute at the moment, and uh, that's that's not because we don't like you. It's because it's much uh, easier to to not have all this sort of sound uh, interference and stuff. But what we're going to do now is is go through. Um, we've got a selection of some of the people who um, who submitted uh, works for for the open call. Uh, and we've asked them to come and uh, say a few words about their um, their drawings. That so there's, there's a huge range of different uh, pieces, actually. Some of which are drawings, some of which are collage, um, and some um, uh, well, there's there's <laughs> there's one which is also um, cooked. Um, <laughs> we'll see in a minute uh, what that means. And um, what we'll what we'll do is we'll go through everybody and um we're going to then have a presentation from joel seif uh, who is has been working with a group of year five uh, school students on a, a project uh, mapping their own experiences of the um of the of the of the pandemic and the, their own um yeah their own worlds let's say um, so what we'll do is we'll first go through everybody's presentation and then we'll leave space at the end for questions. Um, but if you have a question that comes up in the meantime, there is a chat window somewhere, um, which you can find, I think at the top of the screen, there is a, a thing where you can type in the chat. So you can type in the question there and we can come back to it at the end. Um, so first up we have Andrew Howe. So uh, I need to now find Andrew in the list. Um, Andrew is unmuted now, so he's... Oh, okay. okay, good, great. Hi, Andrew. Hello, hello, good evening, everyone. And uh, well, th thanks for inviting me along, um, Sol and, and Kimball. Um, when, uh, so when I was very kindly invited by Kimball to inv submit a map of my utopia for the mapping the pandemic projects. Uh, it didn't take me very long actually to decide that I didn't need to invent an imaginary place, but that my, my utopia was already potentially close at hand. I'm a walking artist and live in the Frankwell area of Shrewsbury. And like many people out walking during the COVID lockdown, I renewed an interest in the minutiae of my local area and engaged with nature during an unforgettable spring. I map my walks through drawings, tracings, surface rubbings, photographs, sound and video. I've got you know, you know, a huge wave of creativity and I've gone on to make various uh, artist books from these materials. And I've contacted other artists in Frankwell uh, to make a collaborative book that would cele celebrate our community. And elements of my work are incorporated into the utopian map you see today. And that's a collage grid of prints and photos and rubbings from the landscape. And it's a neat way of combining the real and imagined. Because although uh, residents of Shrewsbury would probably recognize this location, um, I have brought my utopian version of that existing place and that's quite an empowering process. But why Frankwell? And how can it be a utopia? So, as you may be able to detect from the map, Frankwell sits within a loop of the River Severn, connected to Shrewsbury by the Welsh Bridge, that's on the left hand side of the map. And it developed in Norman times, so it's quite an old part of town developed by free traders outside the jurisdiction of the Lord of the Castle and later became known as the Little Borough. So it was exempt from borough taxes. So it's always been a bit of an outsider place, even though it's now surrounded by the rest of the town. It grew as a river port and a busy community of trade and industry. 
and much of its historic past is evident in the buildings that remain. But in recent times, modern buildings like the Theatre 7, that's right in the centre there, and the University Centre of Shrewsbury, formerly the Guildhall, uh, they're creating a new identity. Now, across the town, Shropshire Council and Shrewsbury Business Improvement District, they're developing a big town plan. It's involving uh, got a lot of public consultation and it's been going for about two years and they're just developing the master plans. And I've been involved in this as a resident and through membership of the Shrewsbury Civic Society Planning Committee. And until recently, the big town plan had not really addressed the fact that the Frankwell area shown in my map is perhaps the key gateway to the town and it's in need of quite a lot of care and attention there's some derelict buildings there which the stew and the maltings which um, which i'll talk about um which are really pretty sad state at the moment <clears throat> and to the right of the map and in front of the university is a very large car park which generally floods during the uh well the recent floods in fact and visitors to shrewsbury must you've got to get from that main car park they have to navigate over the river across a busy road by footbridge into a now near empty and neglected concrete shopping center in order to reach the main part of the town so it's not a greatly uh, great inviting uh, prospect for visitors to the town uh, and it seemed to me that with relatively little investment in new infrastructure uh, and perhaps a more radical change in attitude to sustainability the riverside area situated between the university and theatre could be a vibrant cultural centre. At the centre of this, the two buildings, the Stew and Glen Maltings, are empty and derelict, yet both are evidence of the area's history with great potential for new uses. The Stew dates back to the 15th century, but its recent planning history is complicated and controversial, and um, it's become quite difficult to, to develop that building. There are some practical engineering matters like river flooding uh, that would require some imagination to deal with, but that's not insurmountable. So my, my utopia includes a mix of cultural and sustainable uses building on what already exists. And the only new building would be a pavilion, the public meeting place for performance events, music recording studios, cafes and street food. And elsewhere, car parks could be converted to community allotments, orchards, and green spaces that connect with surrounding flood meadows. So there's quite a lot of wild space which is off to the um, just be beyond this map uh, that you see. And then there's a new lower level footbridge would replace the old concrete one allowing people to reach a traffic calmed boulevard along the riverbank. It would be a place for community sharing and learning with a library of things, repair cafe, flexible office and workshop spaces, artist studios and contemporary art gallery, free public transport and a place where natural landscape is nurtured and allowed breathing room. This is my utopia, but I think it reflects what I hear from many people about their hopes for a green recovery post COVID. Hopefully I can put this map to use in provoking public debate with the community about how they might shape the place we live in. And that's it. Beautiful. Thank you, Andrew. It's a beautiful uh, way of showing how um, making making a map, you know, can actually be a real way of communicating uh, ideas to, to people. And I'm sure that local people will, will also recognize these elements in, in a very um, yeah connected way. It'd be interesting to talk about that later. Yeah, yeah sure. Um, Great. So next up, we have, oops, oops. Next up, we have Rafael Gundelman. So Sol, are you on the ball with knowing how to do the unmuting? Yeah, I'm. I'm trying to do it now. One second. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> Hi. How are you? Great. Thanks for joining us. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks so also for the invitation. Uh, so I made this this drawing um, thinking in, in in our present days and 
also in, in the future, uh, in Chile, but in the world. Um, so first of all, I would like to talk about the idea of crack in history that I think is kind of a, a very important one in this, in this uh, sketch. Um, I, think, I think in Chile, we had this very big revolt a few months ago in October last year. So that, uh, make, that forced us to stop our lives, stop our routines in order to rethink ourselves, rethink ourselves in a personal way, but also in a social way. How we, how we live together, how we build our, our country, how we build our society in order to, to create a more uh, just and equal society. Uh, you might know that Chile is a very unequal country. So, so we need to solve that problem in order to, to progress, no? <clears throat> and, and I think that, that that idea of cracking history is a very uh, important one and related to what is happening now in, in, in the world with this uh, pandemic. And I think is um, this is an idea I, I wrote I, I read uh, uh, from a uh, Chilean Chilean thinker called uh, Rodrigo Carmi, and I, I talked to to Sol actually <laughs> uh, a few days she left Chile. This idea of 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 uh, an opportunity in the crisis is this idea of a cracking history is is um, to take it as an opportunity to think, to stop for a moment, and to to think what we have built, what we, we have been creating in the, in the in, I don't know, in the last maybe centuries, no? Or years. Um, so it's a time that, that people can think, that people are not forced to, to be productive. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking in, in Chilean revolt that, that we all stopped for a while and we went to the street to, demonstra to demonstrate and people who, who were forced to work every day and we didn't have the time to think about how we build society, they had the time to do it. And I think that's kind of a, a super important thing that is happening now that uh, besides it's boring and it's like, uh, I don't know, they had a lot of like bad things that you can, you can see in this situation, but there's also this time that I think is a precious, precious um, gift in a way. Uh, so I think that's, that's the, main, the main idea of the, of the drawing. Uh, to rethink our society, to rethink our past, so to, in order to rethink our future. And there are different uh, ideas in the drawing. Um, so you have a, a new space of a cooperation and not non-competitive uh, space. You have a collective creativity. Uh, you have uh, um, this idea of, of doing something slow, but well done and so there is a phrase in Spanish that's like lento pero seguro. So slow, slow but well done is my own translation. I don't know if this is right, but it's like I prefer to do it slow but but uh, but good, you know, um, because we have a, a big um, challenge, you know, not only uh, with ourselves but with the, with the planet. And um, but also at the same time, you have in the in the left side the decolonization ministry. So in order to, to repair some serious uh, events of the past uh, as colonization, expropriation, um, racism, well, each country has their own stories of, of things that need to repair, but I think it's also the, at the same moment as we create, also we need to repair. Um, so more or less that's the, the framework of the work and, and I think that all the buildings and the squares is with these kind of open shapes so nothing close so there's no limits and, and, we are, we are, and we don't have a future defined so thank you. Thank you Rafa. I love the way that you visualized it as a city because they're all ideas but it's somehow Kind of contained within this city shape and and the, the the center being this square being this kind of point of connection it's, it's really beautiful thank you. <laughs> um thanks so yeah next we have Minekshe, who i think uh i think she has joined uh oops oops sorry um 
I had it just a minute ago and I got hit with. I don't, don't see Manaksha at the moment. So uh, just a moment ago, but she's gone. Okay, well we'll come back to her. Yeah. But this we'll go was to Claire. We'll go to Claire, yes. Mm -hmm. So uh Hello. Hi Claire. Hi. Sorry, I'm just trying to coordinate putting children on screens and running to another room. Whew. Um, <laughs> Um, okay, so I appreciate this drawing probably doesn't really look like a map at all. Um, and I guess in some ways it's, it's a very abstract, uh, it's definitely a very abstract image, but um, I was really thinking about the way that the sort of lockdown and the pandemic situation were making me uh, think a lot more about, have a really heightened sense of awareness about what was happening in my body. I think especially in the first kind of few weeks of the lockdown, kind of being on this sort of hyper alert state for like sensation in my body, like is my breathing, I, I think too, I was, um, I live in you know, living in an area where almost every day in the first two weeks, another family or somebody else I knew would was getting sick was coming down with symptoms so this idea of sort of checking in with your breathing or the way that you're feeling or your temperature and and a really sort of uh yeah much more intense relationship with a sense of how am i or how are all my systems functioning and i guess i was kind of thinking about that internal mapping i suppose as an internal process of mapping i guess about thinking about the the inside of my body and that sort of uh a, a kind of yeah really new sort of heightened awareness of internal landscapes um and and then i guess as that progressed so this drawing is one of a series so i I've been for about three years now drawing every day as part of a sort of process to try and maintain a, a practice, I guess, of, of drawing. And so this is one of a series of, um, of those daily drawings that have a sort of similar theme, this kind of almost tentacular sort of um, structure or, or quite a few of them uh, kind of have knots or chains or loops or intersecting um, uh, forms. And I think, uh, so after that sort of initial kind of period of feeling very like sort of concerned that I might be about to get sick, um, it, it became more, uh, and, and trying to think along the theme of kind of utopias or, or imagined futures, I was actually similarly to what you were saying, Sol, about the idea of imagining food, like suddenly the idea of food became much more uh, sort of at the forefront of my consciousness, kind of thinking about where was I going to get food from or how was I going to get food delivered to me and, and that in itself making me feel much more aware of the possibility of a really hyper-local kind of food system, thinking in new ways about um, about food and and I suppose through that also thinking about internal landscapes and systems so thinking about how our intestines are this absolutely enormous interface with the world um, and our lungs you know you know so the the kind of internal landscapes of our bodies as this I don't quite remember the statistic but you know if they, if they were flattened out would cover kind of square miles of of surface and so thinking about those interior surfaces as interfaces with uh, other matter so whether that's air that we breathe or foods that we eat or liquids that we drink and really trying to imagine I guess a uh, a sort of healing or rem remediation process through those interfaces as well. So kind of a utopian imagining of a future internal landscape 
in which uh, hyperlocal systems, cleaner air, cleaner water, um, super local food become much more prevalent, I guess. And so there is, there's definitely a reflection within it and within the thinking around it about Uh, cities um a yeah a kind of new uh renewed focus on what's in the absolute immediate environment or even in the internal environment wow beautiful thank you claire that, it's it's so interesting the the it's like literally a a map of the body the body relating to the space being in the space and Thank you for your, for your very visceral descriptions. <laughs> no worries. Thank you. Um, okay. So I'm, I have to be a bit of a, bit of a ball breaker with, uh, with, with timings. Uh, and, um, so I'm going to swiftly move on to the next slide. And we have, we have, we have Manexa now with us. Ooh, so I can go back to Manexa then. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So... Have you, have you found her on the. Yep. She's a music. Hi, Manekshe. Thanks for joining us. Uh, sorry, I didn't hear you the last time. No worries, no worries. Thank you. Would you uh, like? I'm sorry in advance because of my English. Maybe it's not enough for you. It's perfect. I really have limited time. Sorry from now. No um, worries. And. Um, Maybe I can say that uh, I wanted to emphasize that um, importance of borders and because in, in, any, in, in an emergency, uh, when we really need, um, we should be able to feed ourselves in every country. So it's really an uh, utopic world for me now. Um, so I wanted to make um, this as a map. So um, and border borders, um, and I want to say that borders shouldn't be more important than people' life. So we can use all of them every time when we need it really. Could you tell us something about the why you use bread and cooking? Yes, this is a um, really um, different type of uh, bread because it's cultural for our, for in our hometown. Uh, it's a Kurdish bread. It's called çörek, and I um, mostly use it for my artworks, and most of my works are edible. And this is my technique, actually. So it's it it's it comes from my childhood. Uh, it's uh, really special for us. Uh, we we make it in in, uh, fa in our fests or special days or holidays, and for guests or. And also it's really cheap in Turkey, but especially in the Kurd, um, in the east, eastern part. So you can, you can easily find it in every bakery. It's also in the breakfast for the workers. And it's a uh, material of uh, people for, for socializing, because people, uh, especially women in the fast times, they are getting together uh, to socialize and they are making tracks all together in the nights. They make tracks and church makes them socialize. Yeah, it's, um, it can be used in many areas. <laughs> Thank you Thank so you. much.
for sharing this. It's such a, it's so beautiful and it looks so tasty as well. <laughs> Thank you. My kids are thinking like that also. <laughs> they ate all. <laughs> <laughs> and I like how it's disappearing as well. It's, it's sort of, it has yeah. of being. Yeah, like, it's my wish uh, also for borders. I hope it can be a pairs. Thank you. Thank Beautiful. you. Thanks and so thank much. Thank you for, for inviting us. Hey, no worries. For <laughs> thanks, thanks, for, thanks for joining. And thank you. Again. Okay. Um, so um, I think we'll pass on to Emma. Mm -hmm. um, Emma, are you there? Trying to find Emma. Can you hear me? She's the, she's, I just saw her on the screen just oh, now. Yeah. Yep, now, now I can see her and yeah. I hear her. Hi Emma. there. Hi, Emma. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay, uh, thanks. First, thanks for inviting me. Um, uh, it was very nice to start this process because I, I'm doing something connected to Utopia in Finland next year, um, like a live art piece. And so this was very relevant <laughs> to start and um, work with the theme. And um, how I started, I, I'm working now with a Sumi Nagashi printing technique. Um, it's a technique where ink is uh, spilled on top of water surface and uh, it's very difficult to control um, the technique and uh, i did an exhibition last year about surface tension and um, i ended up thinking a lot about a little bit the same themes than claire that what happens inside one's body and during the lockdown I was dealing a lot with theme of fear and um, emotions, and then I started working with this technique to conquer, uh, to fight back the fear. So I'm not afraid of uh, not being able to control the situation. I'm just going, uh, taking what's coming, but I'm also trying to be very sensitive and. Uh, and uh, when I'm dealing with materials or anything, I'm thinking about how I'm touching, am I touching or not, and these kind of things. Uh, so uh, these are, uh, I did a lot of different types of prints. And usually I work a lot with black and white, but this neon color just appeared. <laughs> so I felt, um, yeah, it's something new for me and I felt like it is, uh, for me personally, it is a glimpse of hope. So there, was, there were um, bigger surfaces, neon surfaces um, in the pictures where I felt like something good and strong, like a fire is spreading. And uh, it's, it's a very good time to change rapidly what needs to be changed anyway so um, yeah that's basically what I can say now <laughs> cool thanks Emma it's it's so interesting again how the, the, the these kind of marks you know the marks have a particular kind of quality like a tactility which is really relating to your um, yeah to something very internal to your way of sort of relating to the, the world and what's going on and in that sense it's very much a map I love it. Thank mm. you. Thank you. I hope I, I could make myself uh, clear. Uh, there would be so many things to talk about, but yeah, yeah, I hope we all can continue the conversation at some point. Yes, I, I agree. Unfortunately, we, uh, it, we, we <laughs> because if, if it was a physical, if we were all together in the same room, I think it would be wonderful to be able to um, to do this. But the, the nature of the online uh, meetups is that people kind of uh, drift off. Uh, so that's why we're, we're needing to, to be really like bam, bam, bam. So 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Really please, stay, yeah. please stay for the Q&A. We hope to have a little conversation in the yeah. Q&A. Yeah. Oh, and just to yes. remind people as well, there is also the chat. If you haven't discovered it already, there is a chat window. Um, and you can actually, uh, you can also chat to each other in there. There's already a few people who've made some comments. And if you have questions um, to anyone who's spoken already, you can also ask it there. Um, but we'll do all the like chatting with each other at the end. Um, so we'll move on to Sophie. If um, mm-hmm. I ask you, meet Sophie. Yeah, Sophie is there. Hi, Hi Sophie. Hi. I don't know if you can see me, but I can see. Yeah. Yes, we can see yeah. you. Okay. Um, it's probably a good thing that I can't see myself. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So this work. Um, the image on the right is actually a still from a video and um i think kimball was sort of um hoping to be able to show the to play the video but he said that then it, that it wasn't going to be possible but, um, it didn't work, I, but yeah but um i will um i haven't yet because i was kind of keeping all this work um um you know hidden until the project was launched but i will put this um on my um Instagram page and, and there's just a 30 second film with sound and so if anyone wants you know to have a look at that then that will be there but um yeah I um I found this hollow way and um I've always been really I, I've always loved mapping and um maps um travel journeys um mind maps you name it um and but i've been particularly interested in hollow ways for a few years and through lockdown you know i found one and it's 10 minutes from where i live i mean driving not not walking but um i live on the edge of i live on the edge of winchester and in the uk for anyone who doesn't know the uk um and so i'm really fortunate to have um access to this countryside which unlike london has not been built over so you find these sort of fragments of um you know really quite ancient places and um this is a this is a section it's a it's a hollow way that goes into a forest and um but it comes off um a roman road um which connects winchester to the west and that's, um, it's part of Clarendon Way. And the Clarendon Way is a very ancient walking route, um, tra- um, droving path. And, um, and it, it, it is very close to um, where it intersects with um, the Monarch's Way. And that was a real clue for me. Um, so anyway, I started, um, started looking at a lot of maps and it's when you go into this forest there's a um there's the site of a roman villa um it's called the sparsholt roman villa and um a lot of the it was excavated in the 60s and a lot of the objects um including this incredible mosaic floor are in the winchester museum and um so and and i've lived in winchester for 16 years i've known all about this stuff in the museum but i'd never gone up to the site and when you go there there's not a lot to see but it's just a feeling and it's working out where you know the romans moved around so much and there were such um road builders and so that took me down all sorts of rabbit holes you know the sort of what you know and and i i really think there's a very strong chance that even if the trees didn't exist at that time that the path was used by whoever lived in that villa and so i just find that whole roman connection fascinating and then there's also this medieval um story which is to do with um uh a place further south and it was really through i'm not gonna i'm not gonna go into too much detail i'll be talking for too long but um it it um it was really by looking at the at um sort of google maps and you know how when you when you look at um the countryside I mean, maybe not in London, but you know, where where I live, the countryside from the aerial shots, you can still see the layers of the fields and the um, you know, that sort of underlying archaeology. And 
So it's it's really it's just taken me down all these sorts of paths which have been fascinating. But um, but I think in terms of um, you know my sort of utopian idea, I, I just wish people would draw more. I wish people would get out and and the way I draw, which is you know like on the left, that's that's I did that drawing walking through the hollow, hollow way. I mean I've d done loads of them, um, but. Um, you know, I wish I wish people would draw more, but I mean, I, I suppose what's been fantastic about lockdown is that people have found time to be creative and time to think. And I'm hoping that, you know, we'll be able to do more of that and that we will be less consumers and more creators and more, um, you know, have more creative agency just generally across, you know, the population. I just, um, I, I think that that would be such a great thing to come out of, come out of this, difficult time great thank you i love i love it that your your utopian uh, view is that the people will draw more you know there's such a beautiful image of utopia <laughs> like all, um, I, also want, I also want to say that i've seen the video and i can't recommend enough for people to watch the video because it's absolutely beautiful and i think that it's a way of like looking at drawings in a 3D way that I found very, very inspiring as well to draw and to look at spaces with drawings in place. So we'll try to, if, if we can, uh, can't can put the link on the, on the chat room now, we'll try to send it out uh, as a follow-up email so everyone can, can see Sophie's video because it's really, it's really beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. So, yes. Yeah, <laughs> it's really cool. Um, I think you just you just have to see it because it's <laughs> you, you kind of you kind of, describing it doesn't really get the the sense of it, but it's 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 fantastic. Um, and again, one of these really interesting ways of how making marks is a way of connecting to uh, to to the, all these different layers of of history, but also layers of yeah what what's going on, your own relationship to to the space that you're in. Um, it's I love it. It's great. Thank you. So. Um, so next we, have next, we have Laudine. I'm trying to find Laureen. I don't see uh, I think she, I think she's actually, as she has somebody else's name. Uh, I saw her earlier. Uh, I if think. Laureen can. I think it might be this Yente, I think. If Laureen can yeah. appear in the chat room, then we can. Yes. I think that's you. Is yep. this you, Laureen? Yeah, that's me. I okay. my name's Good. I was, I was, I was thinking like it's not your name, but I, I, no. I'm sure that it was you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> no, it's uh, my boyfriend's uh, name. So, okay. Um, okay. hi everybody. Um, yeah. So, um, what I made was um, my family and I. We moved from Amsterdam about a year ago, and we were living. Uh, my boyfriend and our three daughters in Amsterdam on the third and the fourth floor so about a year ago we moved to a small village and we have a garden now which is really nice and during the lockdown in Holland we were allowed to go outside but just be sensible about it so we did go outside for walks but mainly we stayed in the garden and um, so a bit like Sol said and some other people mentioned it too that for some reason you start to think about food so we started a vegetable patch. So we walked uh, to the end of the garden. We built a chicken's um, house. I don't know if you call it that way. And uh, for the kids, we also uh, built a tippy uh, tent in the garden. So we were making a, in the end, I think a small town in our village, in our garden. And um, when Kim asked me to join, I was thinking about it the whole time. And when I was sitting down in the garden, I saw that um, we made a sort of like a Richard Long in our garden, uh, a path made by walking by the five of us. And then I thought, well, there's my map. So actually I made it or we made it without thinking about it. And then I thought um, if this uh, lockdown uh, would uh, take longer than expected, maybe in the end the path would be so deep that we would dissolve into the earth. And then I thought that would be a bit scary. So then I imagined it would be nicer if underneath we would find out there would be a staircase or a, like an escalator leading us somewhere else. So it was a bit of a, yeah, so that's, uh, that was my view about it. And um, yeah, that's it. Like a stairway to heaven. 
Yeah, or and it also reminded me of a book, but I read it ages ago uh, called The So Called Utopia of uh, Center, Center uh, Bobur. Very interesting book that um, it's about, I don't remember it, it exactly, but um, so Centre Pompidou, um, and, um, they, they imagined that there would be an upside down Centre Pompidou uh, going down into the earth, like six floors down, and then on the bottom level, it would be a space where you could do whatever and everybody could go there. Very crazy book. And uh, so I thought that would be really nice that you could just go into the earth and there would be something amazing, art things happening. Um, yeah, so that was a bit of the uh, idea about it. Brilliant. Fantastic. Yeah. Uh, that's really cool. It's really uh, interesting again about the, the traces and the, um, yeah, the, the, the link with Richard Long. Um, and the, the you know the, that it's kind of it just happens you know you couldn't do anything yeah. about it but then this is the the, the line of uh, exactly uh, I like the idea of the city the city in the garden <laughs> yeah yeah thank you great thank you're you welcome. Claudine you're welcome <laughs> thanks for joining us um I think that's oh no there's one more okay so I'm gonna I'm gonna just go on to Margaret Yes, I've asked to unmute Margaret now. Is Margaret there? Margaret Ramsey. Try to unmute a couple. Oh, yep. Oh, oh. sorry. I've just, I, I just muted her again <laughs> by mistake. Sorry. Okay, I'll, I'll mute. Uh, there you go. I've unmuted myself, hopefully. Okay, great. Yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah, uh, can, you hear, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, my name is Margaret Ramsey, and I, I moved to Faversham in Kent uh, from London about five years ago. And um, before lockdown, I was travelling reg very regularly by train to London to visit galleries and museums and for art courses at uh, City Lit. And uh, I made a lot of artworks based on my journeys because they were my space out of time. When it, in, on the train, I didn't have to think about anything else but looking out the window or whatever. And that included an installation of stitched overlap booklets of tracings of maps along the route. I mainly work in textiles and I'm interested in working through stitches of layers of worn fabrics. And I made two pieces based mainly stitching on the train referencing the continual repeats of my travels and record and also I've done records of walks on strips of calico. Um, I've always dreamed of living, living by the sea and although Faversham's uh, not on the coast I bought a folding bike and I took it on the train and I used to ride it between along the Viking coastal trail and I they've got lots of breakwaters there and I used, and those breakwaters inspired quite a lot of textile pieces as well. But in lockdown at home, without all my travels by train, my focus has been very local. And what's kept me going is along with three friends, we've been taking it in turns to actually set drawing prompts. So today's a 100, 127th day of us setting prompts for each other, drawing. and. Um, and also noticing the very small things. I've been using my bike to explore, um, noting the growth of, uh, we live in a, a, a lot of fruit growing area around here, and uh, noticing the growth of hop, the hop vines, and also buying fruit from traditional cherry orchards with their very, very long ladders. Um, but I've become more risk averse as lockdown has eased because um, compliance I've found is very variable and so although some of the roads that I travel on now are busy I feel much safer on my bike than on foot and it's almost feel like a traveling island with limited contact with people so I'm looking forward to being able to go back on the I don't, we don't have a car so we can only go by so I've not been able to go on train because it was just for key workers so I'm looking forward to being able to go back on the train again to the coast. And my map is basically um, uses photos of my bike altered in Photoshop 
and then deconstructed and collaged onto a background of uh, painted newspaper. Uh, the background actually um, was a leftover from a painting course, and so it is from May 20, uh, 2017. But what I really like is the glimpses of the underlying text and the colours and the layers that you can't really see what's going on. And then, um, so basically, I've now got actually, thanks to this invitation and challenge, I've got lots of ideas I want to take further. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. I, it, it's so interesting how the it the, the map the, the is actually the bike the the deconstructed bike but it also the bike is your sort of form of transport through your you know your 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 neighborhood through your explorations and so yeah it's interesting how the image of the bike deconstructed actually the the form of transport is the map it's that's it's, right it's but right. also the uh, breakwaters i thought the spokes looked reminded me very much of the breakwaters as well mm -hmm. you know so it was like and then also the fields that lie behind the, particularly the area of Birchington as well. So, yeah. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. I, th I think that we have only uh, two images left. Um, yeah. These are from people who weren't able uh, to participate today, but we just wanted to give you a glimpse of the different other utopias that we can, we can find from uh, the open call. And this particularly from the Di Barolia Munoz family, also based in Chile, and it's, it's, a, it's a drawing that was made uh, as a family uh, in this kind of musical uh, utopia where everyone is enjoying some kind of music concert. And then we also have um, the next one is uh, Tadea Casilda de Piña, it's collage as well, but I think that is another very powerful image about this different worlds and and how like women, children, household, and nature are all intertwined. We want to hopefully um, have a, an article where, where the people who had the open submissions will be able to voice their utopia. So, so hold on and uh, hopefully in the Living Maps review at some point we'll, we'll publish these little stories as well so you can enjoy them. And then now we have our final section. Yes, so Yes, great. So now this is the point where we have to hand over to Joel. Yep. Uh, and uh, Joel, are you there? Is that unmute me? Ah, there he is. I'm muted. Hello. Hi. So I will stop sharing my screen and then I will pass over to Joel. Yep. Sure. Attempt to share screen. Bear with me, everyone. Uh, yep, now you can try it. Okay. Do, um, some background music, just like an advert or something where I'm just <laughs> <laughs> finding, finding my way. Here we go. Does that come up? Yes. Yeah. Joel has started sharing screen. There you go. Oh. Okay. Right, I'm, I'm told, hi everyone, thank you for having me. I'm Welcome. told I've got very strict 15 minutes tops. Yes. I also uh, said to Sol and Kim all the other day, I have a propensity to waffle, so please just wave at me if I'm waffling too much. Um, I am working in the south of England, not a million miles away from Sophie in fact, um, and I'm working with year five children in a primary school. So that's 10 year olds. Um, but for 30 years or so, I've been working as what's called a play worker, which is essentially someone who's um, doing everything they can to support the, um, the rights of children to play in any way that they, they are able to. So um, my vested interest is children's play. But I was uh, keen to get involved with this project because um, I've seen a lot of stuff go on, uh, on on the field and the playground and in the classrooms at school. Some of it, good, good, happy stuff because children are sort of fairly resilient. However, some of it, if you look below the surface, you you know that um, you know, the lockdowns affected children, as as probably all of you will uh, appreciate. So I've got 15 minutes. I've got 14 drawings. So I've basically got a minute of drawing to whiz through. What I what I um, have got is five drawings at the end of, that are 
more or less dream utopias nine drawings at the start which have elements of utopia in it but i wanted to show you all of them because there's kind of it's a build up and i really love children's drawings because they just tell me so much anyway so I hope it's, it feels a little bit like i'm showing my family slides from a holiday but it's <laughs> Right, I'm, I'm, I'm going to use uh, fictionalised names, um, so I'm going to have to try very hard not to use real names. Um, so here we go, let's go for it. Um, so the first one, this is Ruth, and what I wanted to point out in this one, the, the story of Ruth's drawing is, um, comes through Google Classroom because we did a lot of work um, online. Some children are key worker children, so they were able to come into school over lockdown. Ruth didn't. Um, but I got kind of a, a written version of this as well. And the big thing for her is, is the woods in the top right hand corner because she just said a very simple story of, I never realised there were so many squirrels out there because uh, I never realised that the nature was uh, so, not in her words, but so abundant because um, it was all quiet, certainly for the first few weeks of, of lockdown. Um, there's two more things I want to point out on, on Ruth's drawing. And one is something that always fascinates me with children's drawings. It's kind of the, the outsized building. The home is central. It's, it's kind of the half, but even more so in today's society of, of maleness. The half is, 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 is huge. And the other one is that great big black ribbon that runs through the middle, which um, is in this, in this drawing, I interpret it as, as kind of a boundary. Um, but I love the way that she's drawn it. It's just beautiful. She's got something underneath that. A little bit of context. Um, I went to architecture school 30 years or so ago, and I always remember one of my tutors talked about monuments, which I see in Ruth's drawing here, and uh, toothpaste, which is, as I interpret it, is, is all, the, all the, um, the roads in between. Um, Ruth's toothpaste is a barrier. Um, and you can see she's definitely put her football. She loves her football on the other side of the toothpaste. I'll come back to that. Right, second drawing is um, what they called him, Oscar. Oscar's got four quadrants. I'm fascinated by Oscar's four quadrants um, because his, his toothpaste is a boundary. It's very much enclosing um, four spaces. And if you're able to read his writing, he's got um, three, um, three spaces where he has gone over lockdown. On the top left is his, his utopia, basically. The fish and chip shop, which comes up uh, several times in children's drawings and zoo animals come up quite a lot in children's drawings but the thing that i really wanted to highlight apart from the monument of home in the center is in the bottom left and oscar's story is about his puppy he is getting a new puppy from the little blue house and it's not his house every time i talk to oscar it's about his puppy puppy comes higher than school higher than the fish and chip shop higher than his mate's house in the bottom right hand corner puppy is very important to oscar and I think there's a kind of a surrogate thing going on here. You know, he can't see all his mates, so his puppy's the next best thing. Which I think is kind of beautiful but sad at the same time. In a good way. I'm also really fascinated by uh, Wesley's drawing because it's got that whole boundariness again. Um, it's a really black line. I did a similar project in London a few years ago and I worked with children and probably without fail, as I remember correctly, all the lines were interpreted as black lines. Um, I know tarmac is pretty black, but you know, children often, but not always, as you'll see at the end, um, denote it like this. But what's probably most interesting about Wesley's drawing for me is in his legend in the top left-hand corner, you can't really read it terribly well on the screen. He's got um, he's got the top top center. He's got the big green thing, which is the school, significant. He's got his home there as well. He's got his town underneath. I interpret that, the story of his drawing, as these are the things I have done. This is the boundariness of my life in the last couple of months. Top left is the forest, top right is the, uh, the beach, bottom left is Wales, all the places where he's not been. Um, so it's a very sort of enclosed drawing. Um, and uh, obviously you don't know this, but I, I can interpret these drawings through their characters as well. So um, I'm on it. He's a, he's a very settled young man, but he wants to get out. He wants to escape. Right, I feel like this is a whistle stop tour. I, I love all of these drawings, and I'm again, I'm particularly um, fascinated by uh, Billy's drawing um, because the top part and the bottom part are kind of um, schematically different. And the top part is a very sort of as I as I see it, it's a very um, set route, um, 
around town with a parent maybe i can i pretty much know exactly what this route is because he's written a pub i don't know which pub it is but let's face it as adults we quite often navigate by pubs he's written bridge river ice cream i know exactly where the ice cream man is um, and that big ecclesiastical building in the middle you know I, i've got a good idea where that is and it really resonates with me because i kind of draw maps like this as well about way marks way marking points the bottom part i interpret is a much more um it's a much more fluid dream element although he's got school he's not really been to school um, but he's got the beach and he's got his holiday home and he's got his body board and there's the fish and chip shops again so it's a much more sort of like want uh, place rather than the top part which is a this is what it did place okay um what have we got next this is fran um i've got a salutary tale about fran's drawing apart from the fact that uh 3D drawings just amaze me. The park is play again, but it's very sort of contained in a set route. Um, but the main, oh, the other part is the top right hand corner. This is town, but it's got a sort of dark satanic mills aspect to it. But I like the fact that nature bursts through the whole thing. Um, the bottom right hand corner, I said to her, Tell me about the yellow house. And she went, It's not a house, it's a beach. And uh, I thought, ah, do you know what? I've broken the golden rule. I learned 30 years ago when I was working with early years children. Don't, don't guess, because a giraffe could quite easily be a horse and you don't know. Um, and she, you know, she's very graceful about it, but I have to remind myself, you know, it, it's, it's not what I think it is. It's what she thinks it is. Okay. Um, oh, I just want to mention about the toothpaste for the middle. We're kind of shifting from boundariness in Fran's drawing to, to Toothpaste is root. Okay. Um, this has got a, a story to it. Um, it's quite difficult to tell, but if I lead you through it, this is Wilf. Um, his story is all kind of contained in the in top couple of elements. He's got current house leading directly to new house, brackets currently destroyed. His whole story, whenever I talk to him, is how he's moving into a new house and um, it's being refurbished by the look of things. But he's still got some play equipment there. He's got his trampoline, he's got uh, garden play swings and so forth. Um, but he's kind of, um, what, when I look deeper into this, he's separated the whole thing out. So his garden is across the road from his house. And the park is in between. And the beach, we're nowhere near a beach, but his beach comes between the town and at the bottom of the golf course. So I'm fascinated by the fact that this could easily be uh, in some descending order of priority for him. Um, and Sophie, if she's still around, she may well uh, work out where this is because they, although I didn't say to the children, um, mark on, annotate exact places, he has actually put a place which, if you're local to this area, you'll know where that is. So, but I can tell pretty much, I don't know where he lives, but I can, I've got a good idea where he lives from his map. Um, it's also interesting that his, and I keep coming back to the toothpaste element, the road, it, it's kind of broken down again. It, it's kind of neither boundary more definite route it's a kind of um it's a walking through time so or walk, walking through priorities rather um i should have said at the start that there's a lot of this stuff about children's drawings is very adult interpretive so um you know children can tell me their stories directly but i i can also interpret it. it's kind of like a i don't know a meta story a story about a story in the way that i interpret these things um when I first saw this, saw this drawing, this is uh, Romain, I've called him. Um, when I first saw this drawing, uh, some of you, Sol and Kimball, you may recognise this because there's a there's a, an exemplar of this on the Living Max website. Um, and I, I took a few copies and pastes for the children in the class to say that th these are examples of various maps. And what, what he's done is basically he's copied the model. When I first saw it, I thought, ah, oh, what, what have you done? Why didn't you draw your own? But then I thought, no, you have drawn your own. It's entirely valid for him to draw something based on a uh, on something someone else has used. I mean, that's what art is about in a way sometimes as well. But the fascination for me here is is um, his he's got almost like an umbilical cord, the home at the bottom there. In no way, shape, or form am I, am I even thinking about the fact that he's interpreting his road as an umbilical cord. Um, he's too young. He's, he's actually a year four, so he's nine. But he's got this sort of fat blobby road. Which is a very definite marker between um, his house, his mate's house, the park, and if you read the notes at the bottom, he's got even school 
and which I find as a fascinating observation from a nine-year-old, that um, you can even go to school in, in times like these. His, uh, his, his yellow blocks almost like Minecraft, or, uh, you know, which is a big thing, I'm sure. Um, they are very bounded, and maybe that's why he chose that as a model. Right, how am I doing for time? I've got a few more. I'm hoping I'm, I'm good. Um, Callum, second. You've got, you've got about five minutes. All right, I'm going to whiz through the last ones then. Callum's is, well, I'm about halfway through, so I'll go a bit faster. Um, you probably won't be able to read the writing, but, you know, that massive, great big home at the start. Callum's is all about play, which is why I put this in his collection. You know, at home, he's, he's got his playing on his PS4, he's got playing ball games, he's got football, going to the park, I'm following the route round, home down and to the right. Um, and up to his grandma's house. Um, no school whatsoever for Callum, which I find very interesting. This is Joe's. When I first saw Joe's, I was like, that's a bit basic for a 10 year old. However, I immediately told myself off because when I thought of Joe as a personality, um, he hates school, absolutely hates school. His is, and I keep coming back to this, his is all about play. Top, top uh, center is his home, his Xbox, talking to his friends. No school, happy face, going around clockwise. No park, sad face. No football, sad face. You can read the rest. Um, you know, this says so much about this personality. And this also says, reading between the lines, this is what children have needed in the last few months. You know, if they've not had opportunity to go to school, meet their friends, they are really missing their mates. And I'll, hopefully I, I can tell you a quick 10 second story a little bit later on, link into that. Um, these, these are the last five, and this is Edie's, and this almost broke my heart when I opened up this file. Um, she, uh, this is her dream world. Um, she uh, tells me she's a, she's a story writer, I know that. She connects to me because she knows that I'm a, an author as well. Um, it's very self-explanatory. Take it from the sun in the, in the top right all the way around. She misses her family in the north. Um, and her montage, her, her collage, is the only one that's digitally produced, and it just says so much to me. She's also a very empathic child, um, and she's thinking about the world, a cure for the world, and not just a cure for her family. Um, yeah, I almost cried about that. Um, it's a little bit difficult to see. This is, um, where are we? This is Floss. Floss's story is in the bottom right-hand corner. You can just about see an aeroplane with a Canadian flag. Her family's in Canada. She desperately needs to see them. She hasn't seen them uh, this year. She sees them once a year. But, you know, I take the positives in Floss's drawing. She's got a, she's got a big old toothpaste line in the middle. It's not black. It's, it's, a, it's a happy colour. It's very fluid. It's, um, it's not a boundary and it's not a definite route. It goes everywhere. She's got lots of animals there. She's got Wagamama, you know, she's got the fish and chips at the bottom of the beach. A lot of the elements we've seen in the other drawings. Um, I, I get a lot of positivity, positivity out of her, her drawing. Right, I've got three to go. Um, I put these in a definite order, as you may have uh, guessed so far. Um, this is uh, Magda's. And Magda's got no school at all either. This is a really happy, bright, this is what I want to do sort of drawing. Um, she's She's all about the play. She's all about her friends. My interpretation underneath this is, um, you know, from reading her writing as well, she misses her friends so much and, and all the things that you can do. Um, I'm going to introduce my, my 10 second story that I said earlier on now. Whilst at school, I've generally got this golden rule that, you know, what happens on the field or the playground stays on the playground or the field. I'm going to break my rule in this one. Um, and that I would work on the year six as last couple of weeks, uh, sort of 11 year olds, they're just finishing up their primary school life and um, they're desperate to see their friends. If we're working in bubbles, they're not allowed to interact across the bubbles of the field. I caught them hugging the trees. I said, guys, what are you doing? They're, they're, we're hugging trees because we can't hug our friends. I almost cried about this one. So, right, last two. This is included, this is Sebi. He's who I call Euro boy. He's uh, got Italian, Spanish parentage, regularly off to the continent. And I think this just shows in his drawing because it's a little pale, but he's got the mountains in there. He's got all the fields. He's got a sea, the Care Paravel Sea. I've no idea where that is, or even if it's a real sea, but he wants to go there. He's even got a space center. Um, he's, he's a very um, 
European child and is trilingual and is an amazing child. Um, and she's got um, a lot of uh, eco awareness. Um, and I think that shines through in his drawing about what he would like as a, as a dream world. He's even got the temperatures on his map, which I find fascinating. Mm -hmm. Got that really close. It's like nothing below 30 degrees, I don't think. Even the mountains <laughs> up high. So this leads me to the last one, and this is Richie. And I put this one last because it's kind of got pretty much everything in the last 13 drawings in it. Um, I love Richie's central part of this because it's almost a medieval version of a town. Again, I'm not sure he's thinking this way at all. But the regularity of the houses, he's got a boundary of toothpaste road going on there. He's got the animals, he's got Mackie D's and Domino's and all of that. And he's got the airport, you know, that a couple of the other drawings, there's very much need to escape to Canada or escape somewhere. Um, and if you look in the bottom right hand corner, or just above the bottom right hand corner, you've got the water sports as well. So he's got a lot of fun stuff going on there as well. Culture in the museum. Bottom right hand corner, he's got the school. I've had to mask out the name of it. We, we don't live near the beach. We're not a million miles away, you know, it's a trip down the motorway. But he's relocated to school right on the beach, which I think is a very sort of utopian thing to do. And, um, definitely suits his character. I think I'm going to end there. I, think I've, I don't know how many minutes I've had, but I've had That's enough, enough to cover all my bases, I think. Thank you so much, Joel, for your wonderful you. presentation. It's, it's beautiful seeing kids' drawings. They're, they're, there's so much in them, and what, what you said uh, about not over-interpreting them, just allowing them to explain what, what it is themselves without sort of, you know, your own projection is, is, is so, yeah, it's such an important thing to do and so, so beautiful to, to hear that. I've, I've had some experience with, with uh, uh, drawing with kids as well and I've, I've noticed that sort of temptation to, to interpret what it is, um, but really if you let them just explain, um, you know, what it is, they always have like an, an idea, of, like really kind of clear idea often of, of what that sort of, splodge on the paper yeah. you know, represents yeah th um, thank you so much for sharing the story so I, I just love like listening to you and, and and learning of how close you are as well to their dreamed worlds uh, so I guess like this is a moment that we can uh, pass to the Q&A uh, section I was going to ask uh, maybe Joel to stop screening the screen so yeah. stop sharing the screen uh, so maybe we can uh, see at the same time, yes, now everyone is there. So um, you can either uh, pop uh, in the chat room if you want to make a question, just uh, say so, and then uh, we'll unmute you. So that might be the easiest way to do it without everyone speaking at the same time. <laughs> so any questions to any of the speakers? You can direct it to any of the speakers. So I don't know if you have found the chat room that is um, below. So if you go to the bottom of the screen, there's something that says chat and then you can uh, pop your name there. I will see you. Team, do you want to go first or it's just a comment? Let me, let me unmute you. Yep, that's Tim. Hi. Hi. Yeah, and I, I'm a parent governor of a primary school, actually, and when this is one of the things I've been thinking about. Our kids have all gone back now, and uh, they've got a strong art tradition, and uh, they've been publishing some of their drawings on their, on their own kind of newsletters, and it's great to see. It's, uh, it's lovely. You tend to think about uh, your own predicament, but uh, children are far more, I think, more liberated than us in terms of expressing their feelings. So uh, it's really lovely to see. I hope they you can kind of maybe put some of the other work uh, up on a more kind of public way, because I don't think many um, schools really publish, or I think they're probably state sensitive, I guess, for the names, but um, no, it's really lovely to see the maps. It's great, thanks, Joel. Thank you, Tim. Okay. I see that Panush has raised the hand, so I'll, I'll unmute Panush uh, now, I think, if that worked. No? Panush? Oh no, sorry about this. It's the blips of the world of mm. webinars. Uh, so yeah, any other question and anyone, anyone else that has a comment that wants to raise their hand and I'll unmute them. Do 
can see anyone. Everyone's feeling a little bit shy. Uh, okay. Jose Sherwood. Um, maybe. Uh, can Kimball talk a bit more about palimpsests? Says Joel Seath. Um, yeah, can you give context on that? Pardon? Can I give you a little context on that? Yes. Ten, ten yeah. Seconds? yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it stuck in my mind because. Um, I did some mapping a while ago, and uh, it was exactly my thinking process, palimpsest, so what you said earlier on uh, really resonated. Um, and I was really interested in the way that time can be kind of layered. Mm. I don't know if that's your interpretation of it. Uh, and also, Sophie was talking about the Roman road as well. That, and I was, I was straight there, I was just thinking, yeah, I can see these Roman soldiers walking down this path. Yeah. Really fascinated by that aspect. And it's the same with play um play is always there it's kind of like the ghosts of play i mean so i was just wondering how it kind of fitted in with your sure i mean i i it's actually really central to my to my practice as an artist uh that idea of of multi-layeredness um and particularly yeah that idea that that spaces you know exists within uh you know multiple dimensions like physically the, the ground that you're, you're standing on, you know, thinking about the, you know, what was here before the Romans uh, and even before that, when it was, you know, there was nothing when it was just, uh, you know, empty landscape um, and how that land, you know, is just, you know, you're, you're physically in a space, but wh wherever you are sort of, it's still the same space that it was, you know, so many years before and will be in the future. So it's, it's an idea that really fascinates me. Um, and particularly, uh, also, I, I, I only learned the word palimpsest recently, to be honest. Um, and uh, it was somebody who was looking at one of my paintings uh, that told me um, that it was like a palimpsest. Because I've always had an interest in maps and I've always seen my, my, my paintings are kind of, if anybody knows it, they're, they're sort of very colourful, multi-layered uh, abstract paintings, which, which you can see the layer underneath. All the layers are sort of visible um and um and then i realized that actually it's not a palimpsest it's a pentimento which is where you can actually see the the, the layers um it's like a painting on top of a painting and i thought that that's a really beautiful metaphor for a map because a map in a way is a representation of a space um but not just you know a physical space but a, a way that people have imagined it and particularly the person who's made the map um so I, I, I feel like that idea, like the concept of a palimpsest or a pentimento is, is sort of, is that that glue element to, um, yeah, think, thinking about how like art, let's call it drawing, whatever, video, it could be any form of art. It's that connection point between the way that you imagine a place and um, your yeah your own experience within it and the sort of way of representing it. Um, so that's I don't know if that really answers your question, but it's 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 yeah I feel like that the concept of a palimpsest that layer is is the central well, one of the central aspects of that that fascinates me to um, yes. I saw Phil had his hand yeah. up. I just unmuted Phil. Okay. Well, I put it there on, on time set, actually. Um, uh, there's this, a magazine called Entanglement, which is actually, I think, a group of anthropologists from different parts of the world, uh, all rather influenced by the network theory, I think, but never mind about that. But they produced a special issue of the... Film. It's hard to hear you, Phil. Oh, sorry. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Is that better? Sorry. Yeah. Uh, so there's this journal called Entanglements, and one of our uh, corresponding editors, Louis Maxwell, Christoph Varbantakis, is actually an editor of it. And uh, he just sent me the, the latest issue, which is on time sets. So it, it's, uh, they're mainly, um, I think, geographers and anthropologists, but they've got interested in the notion of the map of the palimpsest. So it might be worth checking out. Uh, so there's quite a lot of interest in this idea of multi, you know, multi layering of the map and also the maps as being multimedia uh, formats. 
Um, and certainly, I think you know we're interested in living much in that kind of approach. So, uh, so it makes a lot of connections with, with lots of stuff discussions going on, uh, not only in, in, in with artists but with anthropologists, with geographers, um, and, and cartographers as well. Thank you, Phil. Anyone else that wants to comment can unmute themselves now. Okay. Just before that, I, that somebody asked uh, in the chat, uh, are you are you sharing the? Are, do you have a recording of this? Uh, and are you going to be sharing it for other people to see? There is a recording. The screen is being recorded. Um, I don't know if we've had a conversation about what we're going to do with the recording yet. But uh, we'll inform everyone and send a follow-up email. So everyone who attended the meeting, we hope to contact them through the Living the Maps uh, newsletter as well. So if you haven't subscribed yourself, that's a good opportunity to subscribe to Living Maps uh, network. Uh, if you go to the website, you can subscribe subscribe to a newsletter there and get more information. It'll be it'll be on the website. We're going to put it on the website. So yeah, check the website. Um, so what else? Uh, uh, uh. So I, I read a, a question from Jose Sherwood that says, I would love to hear more about the idea of accessing multiple layers of reality through drawing. So any, any of the speakers that is uh, present uh, that participate in the submission also, they're welcome to respond if they want to. But if not, I think that Kimball as well was talking about layers. Yeah. Does it, if anybody else wants to to say something, then uh, wave or something. Um, <laughs> so um, about layers and drawing. Um, well, say something about about layers and drawing. Okay. So. Uh, um, so. Um, I think, what, um, what should I say? <laughs> I'm a bit stumped suddenly. Um, I think Sophie, Sophie is, is raising her hand okay. as well. So maybe let's, she... let's pass, let's pass over that question to Sophie. <laughs> so, Sophie, do you know how to unmute yourself? Sorry. Yeah, yep. that's it. I, um, I don't know if this is what the question was about, but when I'm drawing, and I think that this is, this is absolutely um, essential to map making, is that you are trying to make sense, or ma trying to make um, a two-dimensional on the whole, um, uh, what's the word for it, Simula simula sim simulation, sim simulation of, of, of a three-dimensional space and and i think that that's so fundamental to drawing is that um you know with whether it's perspective i mean obviously with abstract drawing less less so but um uh it's this um com it's this making sense of things and and um well working things out through drawing i suppose and i think that so you know drawing is is um uh even though it's you're you're on the whole you're using a two dimensional two two dimensional technology you're thinking in three dimensions and I that I find just so fascinating but I mean I think that's one of the things that drew me to this um, augmented reality drawing which is what I've done in in my film and um, but essentially uh, my drawings my abstract drawings um, you know like. It, it's like um, it is a map or it's like rapid eye movement. It's like I'm mapping what I'm looking at. It's like fragments of, of what I'm seeing. And it's this, um, it's this close looking and this attention and this holding myself in the present moment. Um, anyway, I'm sort of rambling on, but um, I think that the, this demet the, Two dimension and three dimensions is um, is fascinating, and you know when you think about the um, the cave paintings, the um, you know the really really early ones where they were actually created a, a kind of three dimensional effect. You know they actually used shading. Um, um, the out the Altamira caves, I think, is those are the ones where they they actually use shading and 
so, and, and whereas that representation of three dimension was not really seen again for you know hundreds well not hundreds but tens of thousands of years but um but i i, I think that um you know mapping is is a way of making sense of the world isn't it and it, and if you're if you're not wanting to to use words i think that uh mapping is a way of thinking without having to have language mediate the whole process yeah yeah it's interesting what you said about seeing in in sort of two and three dimensions uh because drawing can be really that sort of connection point uh of, of you, you you sort of enter into another another world it's sort of a, a third space in a way with the, the the point of connection like you could draw with your eyes closed for instance and yeah uh, sort of imagine another space um i see there was uh, someone had their hand up just now um marilyn uh it's gonna pass over to you can you hear me yes yes oh the the last couple of comments we dug deep into my memory uh from a, a sort of play technique uh with with young children uh in school um i've forgotten all about it where you just don't need language to to map and to make something together and it was um as so though on a piece of paper was looking down on the classroom or the school and just by putting a, a series of dots in certain places the children could interpret it as to what it was so that might be uh queuing up to leave the classroom or that might be the reading corner or that might be when a child went over and spoke to their friend and just by the dots every child could create a moment in the classroom that had happened to them it was it, it's very very freeing and a, a lovely lovely technique and then they they expanded it and made these um, mind map or dot maps for other other activities in school and then they would ask each other to guess what was going on it's, uh, I'd forgotten all about it until I think Sophie reminded me by what she said. Yeah. Thank That's, you for sharing. Sounds like a really nice method. Yeah, yeah it's I'd forgotten all about it. Also, uh, one one sort of important thing to to say about drawing, and I I, I wanted to sort of make that point at the beginning is. Um, I think often pe when people think of drawing, they think about this idea of representing something, um, but I think drawing is not necessarily a representation of something drawing is a process and and i and i that's why i prefer to use the term mark making and, and often these sort of exercises yeah. where you do like making maps making drawings of your memories uh whatever it's it, it, like when you think about it as um making marks on a paper it is yeah. something as like pr as primal and primitive and and sort of um uh, physical as as literally being the connecting point between your mind and the paper it's, it's yes and and uh, these 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 marks were meant that anyone could interpret it uh to fit their version of the day the story uh, themselves mm. it was nice. fascinating nice uh, it sounds sounds really cool yeah i'll have to i'm gonna have to play i'm gonna have another play with that yeah. <laughs> i've forgotten all about it because you could take you could take the covid story you know the the empty streets and then just a couple of dots and immediately you could translate you know who was that who crept out <laughs> who you know yeah it's i'd forgotten it mm, how powerful that is thanks sophie <laughs> Thank you. um Oh, sorry. Yeah, I'm finished. <laughs> I'm going to take my analog hand up rather than find the digital one. Joel, do you want to say something? Yeah, just picking up on what was just said there. Um, it's not exactly the same, on, on, but, but it was really interesting to hear that, that dotting technique because I was thinking about um, not not a drawn map, but the way that I I interpret spaces where children play, because I spent a lot of time around children's play spaces, is I kind of kind of use a hybrid of um, my um, names for places and children's names for places, which isn't too far away from the dot technique. But when I've got a name, I can keep repeating using that name. And if I do ever draw that map down 
all I have to do is write the label and I know what's happened in that that place mm -hmm. uh, and I use the word place deliberately rather than space because mm -hmm. place is so um, replete with uh, time as, as I was just alluding to with asking people the question about uh, palimpsest that it, it's kind of like um, you know it, it's bigger than the space itself so if you if any of you uh, have worked with children or talked to your own children about uh, and if they're open to telling you because let's face it children don't always tell adults about their private play spaces um there's, there's it's rich in in, in history um in just as i interpret it just a small mark on a bit of paper or a word a label that said so for me what i suppose i'm trying to say in summary here is that maps don't even need to be drawn they're, they're kind of oral maps to just Yes. a phrase that I've just made up so yeah that does very much um mm, yeah. and sit very very well yeah yeah mm. um is there any other questions from the floor I see the floor is emptying out. We've moved on to one screen. We were on three screens before mm -hmm. and now we've got one. So uh, we've lost uh, a third of, uh, we're also, we're, we've gone over what we said we would. So um, does anybody have any other questions, thoughts, reflections that they want to share? Maybe it's time to close up. Maybe that's, uh, so thank you. I mean, this, this there's endless conversations that uh, that you know can be had about um, about this topic, um, and you know hopefully we'll be able to continue. And um, yeah, as Sol mentioned earlier on, we we are planning to uh, write something and include the the, the works um, in this uh, you know from 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 this project and and write a sort of more reflective piece for the the Living Maps Journal. Uh, so do um, stay tuned for that. And I think we'll, we also want to do something with the images uh, on the website. Um, what we still need to, uh, you know, figure out exactly how and when, of course, because, uh, you know, PhD and uh, general life stuff is uh in the way of that <laughs> but, um thank you all so much for um joining today thank you for everybody who submitted and those who were able to um present their work as well um can i, can I just interrupt just to thank yeah. uh kimball and sol really for uh oh. putting this event together and uh I mean, i'm a word i'm a wordsmith i'm a visual artist but i find it absolutely fascinating and seeing all, all you know the maps and, and what people have been talking about and it will uh, we are recording it so it will go on the on the website uh but yeah just just to underline that Kimball and Saul put a lot of work into this and uh, thanks to them and thanks also to all the contributors and to joel and to, and to all of you um yeah it's been really good great thank you for all the participants as well and their beautiful submissions and people coming from different countries chile and all around the world so yeah. thank you for participating and yeah. see you next time i guess yes Bye to everyone. Okay. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Ciao. Bye. 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 Bye.